If there's one company that doesn't need any introduction, it is our knowledge partner, McKinsey. We invited McKinsey's Simon Kessler and Christian Eilbeck to share their vision on the future of insurance, but also to take stock on the current state of the industry and what is required to make the essential leap. Please buckle up. Thanks, Simon and Christian, for joining us here in Amsterdam. Good morning. It's great to be back uh, at DIA. I think it has been more than two years since we were here. And a lot has happened in these two years, actually. Um, I mean, COVID hit. Uh, there was a lot of excitement uh, when it came to digital insurance because uh, it was seen as an accelerator. Things would go faster now. People have to switch to digital. Um, we will see if that actually happened. But also other things happened. No? The valuations went up as a consequence. Uh, there was a lot of excitement and valuations went down again. So we saw the tech crisis. We see a lot of other crises right now. We see, um, of course, the war. We see inflation, uh, high interest rates, all with implications on insurance and insure tax. And this is what we want to talk about. And we want to talk about also why, despite all these negative um, uh, hits at the moment, we remain optimistic about the sector. So let me start by giving a bit of an overview of the uh, insurance landscape and our outlook. This is, of course, the underlying industry of insurance and insurtex, and um, this looks actually pretty good. So when you look at it, um, you see that it has been growing quite nicely, also during COVID. Uh, premiums went up, profits went up, and our outlook is also positive. So for the next few years, we expect even a slightly accelerated growth um, on both the top line and uh, the profit side. Why is that? I mean, during COVID, um, pro profitability was not hit as negatively as many expected. Premiums uh, continued to grow. Uh, claims went down, as you know. So um, a lot of additional profit was generated in the PNC space, which compensated for decreases in overall profitability in life. So that actually um, was, uh, was quite positive. Um, at the same time, when you look into customer behavior and what happened during COVID, you see actually a mixed pattern. On the one hand side, you see that uh, people use digital channels, digital touch points much more for, um, for example, claims, for operations. So they had to use now apps, um, websites, phone much more than in the past. At the same time, what did not go up, and this is a bit surprising, is on the right hand side, the share of digital distribution. So digital distribution, and this is PNC, remained basically flat even before COVID and during COVID. Um, and that is a bit as a, a surprise, I would say. At least we wouldn't have expected it. There are a couple of reasons um, when you look back. I mean, one is, of course, uh, given the high profitabilities that many had and that motor is still the key line for digital distribution. Um, premiums did not go up. Actually, renewal prices were often lower than um, in the past. So people didn't have the need to switch so switching went down. You see also with all the price comparison websites and aggregators that they have not really benefited uh, during COVID. So people did not switch so much. There were less a trigger point. And it was also what we see in our research, uh, less on top of mind of customers. So customers, I mean, they thought about all kinds of things during COVID, but not about going digital to buy insurance, unfortunately. So this has not changed. Uh, it might change in the future. But when you look at it, also the absolute share is less than 20% still. Very different market by market. UK, we have more than 50%. Other markets, it's single digit. But overall in Europe, digital distribution is still less than uh, uh, 20%. And at the same time, there is massive transformation. We saw it already before COVID. Uh, we talked about it here. All kinds of, of things going on along the value chain. You see, I mean, customer access is becoming more digital. You see better journeys, better customer experience. Um, at the same time, still a lot of challenges, a lot of complexity, legacies, high admin costs with many of the insurance companies. So also a lot of opportunity for, for insurtex in this environment. So we believe, I mean, these trends, and these are just a few examples, they will continue. Uh, and we will see digital transformation at scale in the next few years, because there are still many, many inefficiencies um, to overcome in the market. And as a result of that, when you look a bit into the future in the next five years, 10 years, this is a bit how we think the insurance landscape will look like. 
So, um, and we try to, to illustrate it. We see still a lot of integrated insurers, of course, so big insurance groups uh, covering the entire value chain from customer access to products, technical excellence, operations, everything in-house. Uh, at the same time, we see also a lot of ecosystems emerging. Uh, I mean, mobility is becoming more and more reality health, and insurance is much more connected with that and embedded. We also see more white label providers covering everything in the insurance value chain but the customer front end. And more and more industry utilities, for example, on the claim side or on operations, uh, insurtechs providing services to integrated insurers, to white label providers, and also to ecosystems. So it will be a more diverse picture in the future, not only insurance companies and then maybe some attackers on the side, but uh, we believe these, these four archetypes will become quite important. But let's double click on insurance uh, and especially insure tax, Christian. Yes, thank you, Simon. So let's take a look at the role and the value proposition that uh, all of you in the room, the great insure tax of this world, have. And uh, let me first start um, on the next page with just highlighting a few examples of your impact. I think we have seen also yesterday uh, great examples, but let me just highlight a few. First, we see a lot of better customer experience. So many of you have simple journeys, have simplified the product, and also the language that customers finally understand what insurance is actually about. Then transparency is a lot of value that you bring to the, to the customer. Yeah? So tech-enabled, so be it via comparing products or prices, but also via customer analytics, making them understand what they need um, and where they are covered. And finally, we of course see tremendous speed in the insurtech space, be it on developing companies very fast, but also interacting with customers at a new pace, be it in claims or in any other um, customer interaction. And finally, beyond the pure customer contribution, there is of course a clear contribution also towards insurers on B2B models as well as to distributors. Building on what Simon just explained on the industry landscape, let's take a look how InsureTech actually fits to it. And we see, of the four models explained, three key roles. One, focused players, and I will elaborate in a minute. We see many InsureTechs having focused on a product, on a channel, or a certain customer groups, and are quite successful with that. Second, I think we also have seen great example yesterday on many white label providers enabling embedded insurers for other industries. And finally, and I think this is one of the most interesting spaces, there are many B2B tech companies along the value chain in claims, in pricing, in core technology that can build industry utilities over time. So let's take a deeper look. We see that focused models, like we highlighted here a bit, actually are showing great first success. So you see they are able to attract uh, hundreds of thousands of customers in just a few years. They are doing this by focusing on products that are not readily available in the market before, like digital SME insurance. They focus on a certain customer group that is not targetedly addressed by uh, larger incumbents or they basically try to play in uh, a digital channel like the aggregator um, and really focus on this. However, if we put it a bit into perspective, there is still some uplift to be expected. We basically took our, all our market data and compared a bit how big are these players right now and did a, um, a detailed analysis. And uh, you can actually see that the B2B and SureTechs are roughly 10% of the direct market which is a good first step. However, it's only roughly 1%, 2% of the overall PNC insurance market, so, uh, which is good if you compare it to the last five years where it probably has been zero before, but there is still a lot of improvement to be, to be seen. Second, let's take a close look into embedded models. And I think we, we've seen multiple examples yesterday. This is about really enabling other industries, other ecosystem to integrate insurance. And you can see examples from travel to automotive to retail tech and many other industries. And it's not only that they enable more customer value, but it's also a tremendous value to all these um, players from other industries that can use insurance to also upgrade their business model and enter a very attractive adjacency. 
Finally, let's take a look at industry utilities. And we put here the example for claims, but you can see similar things also on the pricing side uh, or on the core tech side or the distribution tech side. So we typically have seen historically a lot of claims experts, TPAs growing with a strong business model. What happened next was there are many players emerging along all these different value chain steps. So niche players focusing especially on fraud management or on repair assessment and really trying to conquer uh, a distinct step in the value chain. And what we see now emerging are really new end-to-end -end models. So utility trying to cover the full claims value chain or the full technology value chain. And this will be something that will be here for the future. So this is the overall look into the, uh, the value proposition. Now Simon will go on with a recent look into the funding environment. Yeah, I mean, when we give a perspective on InsureTech, we have to talk about funding and um, valuations. I mean, when you look at it, uh, last year was really a record year. So according to our database, uh, three billion in European InsureTech funding uh, really, I mean, more than doubled uh, uh, compared to 2020. Um, despite COVID, so very, very positive picture. Also this year, actually, I mean, uh, we are still uh, uh, collecting the numbers, but this uh, bar, the white bar, gives you an indication what we believe is possible um, this year. So year to date, we look good, slightly below last year, but certainly above 2020. So um, from that perspective, actually funding uh, looks good. There is still a lot of funding in, in Germany and the UK, as it was before. We have uh, more maturing funding rounds, uh, and currently actually 40 billion in value if you add all the insure tax um, up together, so that's quite sizable. Um, at the same time, what we see, we see an increasing polarization. So this is global uh, fintech funding, global insure tech funding on the left. 7 billion in 2020 went to 14 billion in uh, 2021, so also globally it uh, basically doubled. Um, what you see, however, is that the rounds of 50 million US dollars and more really increased. So there was not so much increase in smaller rounds, but more in, in bigger, uh, more mature funding. And a few examples you see on the right-hand side in Europe, so that is the same trend everywhere. We see bigger, uh, more mature rounds, uh, less of, of seed stage investments. And then, of course, I mean, last year I mentioned it, uh, valuations were super nice. So this is one year ago. Um, you see the valuations compared to the top line, we tried to put it a bit into perspective. So uh, the revenues um, or premiums compared to valuation, you saw multiples of 10, 20, even 30 one year ago. Compared to traditional insurance companies, um, this is very, very nice. Even compared to more digital direct players like Direct Line, uh, this is a very nice multiple. They have a bit more than one typically. Um, so uh, that was a very nice environment. And if we had the speech one year ago, I mean, everything looked uh, quite promising. But this year, unfortunately, this is what happened. Uh, valuations went down uh, quite a bit, 90%, even more than 90%. And um, yeah, uh, still they are uh, higher than traditional insurance companies if you take again a revenue multiple. So you see, for example, Lemonade here with more than a billion compared to a couple of hundred millions in premium. So there is already um, uh, yeah, also a premium on it uh, that you see here. So it went down quite a bit. At the same time, it um, didn't evaporate completely. What are the reasons? I mean, there are a couple of reasons. Um, and of course, I mean, you know, the high valuation levels before, everything went maybe too high. People were too optimistic when COVID hit. Uh, at the same time, interest rates went now up, and if you are a growth company, that will, of course, hit you economically very hard, so capital becomes more expensive for growth. Then we saw the tech business decline, uh, so all tech companies, not only insurtechs, suffered quite a bit. The political and economical unrest that we see right now, and also a bit like uh, what we call here an insurtech business model crisis. So we still see actually many insurtechs not um, scaling as fast as they promised or expected. Um, also, we see that many insurtechs are not generating um, the profits they expected, so not 10x improvement also along the value chain. So that is still, I mean, something that is yet to be proven. 
Um, and all these factors, of course, create a difficult environment for valuation, create also a difficult environment uh, for, for private markets in the future. Um, at the same time, in this environment, we remain still optimistic, as I said in the beginning. I mean, there are, especially in these environments, lots of opportunities. And Christian will tell you why and how these opportunities can be captured. So first of all, we ask ourselves, how big can this space become at the end of this decade? And we took a look, actually, to a bit more major space, which is a broader fintech space. And um, so we looked at the market capitalization of financial services players from the banking space over time in the last five years. And interestingly enough, you can basically see that fintechs that are a bit ahead of the, the broader in, in tech space are actually by now accounting for more than 20% of the market cap of traditional banks. And if you take all of the non-traditional players in the banking industry together, it's actually more than 50% uh, of the total value. So we ask ourselves, what would that mean if we translate this to the insurtech space? And actually, that leads to a value of more than 200 billion end of this decade. So what does it mean? By now, Simon has told you we are roughly about 40 billion in value of the European insurtech space. And if you take the analogy from the fintech landscape that is maybe three, five years ahead um, uh, of this space, um, we see a tremendous potential in this space and a lot more value to be created. Of course, this also requires more investments. So we estimated it would be around 5 billion per year over time to get to this potential as compared to the three we have seen last year. Then we ask our investor friends, but also ourselves, what really drives value at scale? What do leaders have in common that already reached this kind of true scaling phase? And we see three key factors. One is really customer ownership and being able to acquire customers at reasonable economics. So really having a distinct relationship to the customer, which is more than just selling one insurance product, but really over the lifetime, managing churn, improving customer lifetime value over the years. Second, really doing 10x improvements. So not just minor improvements by launching a digital journey, but really improving it by 10x what is the status quo, and thereby also having a basis for substantially improved economics as compared to current players in the market. And finally, all these great companies have a true performance culture and great talent to build it up. However, what does it mean in the short term, given that we heard it's a bit uh, rainy outside? So for now, for the short term, decisive action is needed to also survive uh, this uh, short market downturn. So that means looking at cost, extending runway for the next 12 to 18 months, optimizing the business model for resilience, meaning optimizing the channel mix, also taking in more of the profitable business and not doing growth at all cost, as we have seen it before, and also leverage the opportunity to maybe inorganically or via other ways strengthen the market position. So while this all shouldn't sound too negative, let's, be re let's remind ourselves that companies like Amazon, like Uber, like Instagram, and many others have actually emerged in times like these. And as one of my favorite Formula One drivers once put it, Ayrton Senna, you can't overtake 15 cars when it's sunny weather, but you can when it's raining. So it's a bit raining outside, so let's try to accelerate and overtake. Thank you. Thank you.